Welcome back to the Great Library. Previously, we took the foundations of our project, the Ancient Library of Celsus in Ephesus, from reality into a virtual conceptual space where our architects could start building their vision. In this episode, Frank and Julie refine their conceptual model and present this onto the project engineers to understand how much of their ambitious building concept would really be achievable back in the real world of steel and concrete. Since we were last with Frank and Julie, they've been developing their concept for the Great Library and adding detail to the design, sharing updates with the project owner Matt, and working towards an approved conceptual model. We have this idea that some of the surfaces could actually be adaptive surfaces, the digitally activated set of tiles on the wall. They would act like a building video screen. So somewhere between an old mosaic and a new pixel display. I absolutely love this it's a mosaic parallel in that to com communicate a story and then having that through a in a modern environment where the building is almost coming alive and speaking to you and telling you its own story it would be extremely interesting these two walls call up people call up information and be this this dialogue on either side of the rooms a two-way conversation revealing of the older while permitting the newer taking the the kind of beautiful chaos that is the point cloud and making that something can interact with the roof itself is tessellated no four points are essentially on the same plane but it still describes a surface and there's this moment where you can almost see through that pointless painting to the canvas beyond it the roof and the walls and the materials and that idea of transparency are all in play here surrounding these two yeah. dialogues from the center of that room i can see digital displays which could teach me about the building but also there's a great deal of uh, electrical work that would be required i can experience a say the steel structure the concrete work i can look up at the detail in the roof and how that was put together i can stand in one location turn around and, and really see a lot of what we're trying to demonstrate just in one environment conceptually frank and julie have created something that satisfies every aspect of the brief but the task was never to design something that was easy to build. For us to make the best possible buildings, we need to, to start at that kind of more conceptual um, impossible and then uh, work back from there. Um, you know, and that's where amazing engineers come to play and to push the boundaries of what these limits are in order to turn that into the reality. My name is Øystein Ulvestad. I'm a structural engineer. I've dedicated my life to BIM and, and trying to move from 2D to 3D. When I heard about the Great Library, I was super excited uh, because I, uh, I think the knowledge sharing part of it is, is, is so important for, uh, for the industry to move forward. And then when I uh, got the chance to be part of it, I was, uh, I was so happy because I, I think what the project is trying to do is important to engineers everywhere. If you put every piece of information that you need in a BIM model instead of drawings. You'll always have updated information available for everyone involved in a project, which has massive benefits. The construction industry has been slow to adapt to BIM. I've been quite surprised how positive people have been when they work with our models. They understand their scope of work a lot better. They can collect more data to the model, enrich it, withdraw information in, e in an easy way. They don't want to go back to drawings. Hi, Frank. Hi, Julie. Hi, Oyston. Hello. It's so nice to finally meet you. Yes, yeah. we're happy to uh, to be able to discuss the project with you. We were very excited by the level of detail that Point Cloud was able to give us. You know, something that's half a world away could be that tangible to us. From my point of view, Point Cloud sort of it will give me a sense of where, um, where the bedrock might be and, and maybe there's uh, important things that you don't want to touch in the vicinity. The intervention that we're proposing is something that you know, ultimately would help support the facade and protect it and make it a, a comfortable place to be um, mm. in the midst of uh, this very hot uh, site. 
we picked this project called Dialogue, um, which is basically saying there's the dialogue between this new piece and the old piece. These two things need to live on their own and distinct so that it's not confusing. The inspiration here a little bit was the archeological dig tents that you see that are temporary light-handed uh, structures that, that exist on research sites that allow you know, intellectual work to happen kind of within and, and the kind of discovery of knowledge. And in this case, there's both the, the idea of the discovery of knowledge uh, in terms of the archeological component, but also the historic use of the museum as a, a deposit of, of knowledge. The other layer of dialogue that we added into this is that there are these two elements inside the building, a digital pixel wall, where two people could have a dialogue with each other. My first thought is it's super fascinating. And my, my second thought is uh, how, uh, how heavy will it be? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, that's... I'm glad we're talking to you. It weighs almost nothing in virtual space. <laughs> so I don't think you need to worry about that. When I got my first car, navigation was analog. I would have to bring a book of old maps. And at the same time, most design was done uh, only by drawings and no, no 3D models and the navigation technology and construction industry uh, were both moving in a digital direction. Maps got digital and you could use this uh, sat-nav systems to plan where you were going. And uh, we would design uh, BIM models to, to do better structures. So when planning your, your route while driving, it's pretty obvious that you would choose the digital version. And the same way I feel about construction, it's, it's pretty obvious that you would want to choose the updated BIM models that's always current. Instead of the 2D blueprints, the pretty fast would be outdated. While this process is still far from being the industry standard, there are flagship projects that are leading the charge for change. The Ransalva Bridge, the longest bridge ever built without 2D drawings, is an example of where engineers like Oinstein are embracing aspects of connected construction on huge, ambitious projects. Designing the Ransalva Bridge challenge was the river and the very unstable masses on the western part of the river. And in the middle, there's a valley so you don't want your motorway to be too steep. You also have some local roads and a railroad going underneath the bridge. At the end, that turned out to be a 634 meter long bridge with eight axes crossing the river. It's an extremely complicated and, and complex structure. It contains more than 200,000 rebars and more than 50,000 cast in objects. To make it as slender as it is, we needed 250 post-tensioning cables and it's been casted in more than 200 poor stages. And our project owner insisted that this be a, a drawingless project. So we had to tell our designers. We needed to, to create a team that was specialized not only in good engineering, but also in modeling. This was the first uh, bridge of this size and of this kind uh, to be built uh, like this with these uh, new technologies. So the, the, the working environment was uh, quite stressing as well, but very, very easy to work because we understood each other's problems and all of the team was motivated to make this work um, and to show that this technology is very, very easy to use and that it can be improved in this type of bridges. Trying to show a design that's as complex as this in 2D drawings is very hard. In a 3D model, you're able to display complex geometry in a way that a 2D drawing is, is not. With just drawings, there was always something that was in the way or something that uh, had to be uh, fixed on the site that uh, we just didn't have to even think about when it came to uh, this bridge because the, they had already picked it up in the design phase of the project. When people drive over it, I don't think they ever think about these things, but underneath them is a super complex structure that took many experts and many pioneers to build. 
I have to drive over the bridge every day to work. Every time I drive over this, I think about I was a part of the people that made this possible. So it's very fun to have been a part of it and also been a part of the next step forward in technology for this kind of constructions. We believe that this will be the future for not only for bridge design, but for other disciplines as well. And we are very proud and very happy to have participated on this first uh, challenge. Behind us is the proof of concept that this way of working works and it's possible. I must say I'm extremely proud of the people that uh, designed it, of course, but also the people that at site were able to build it based on only BIM models and didn't have any drawings to, to rely on. Well, there's no denying that that's a feat of engineering by anyone's standards. As with all the projects featured in the series, each highlighting a different real-world use of an aspect of connected construction, we'll be adding the Rand Selva Bridge to our digital Great Library. Having moored his kayak and hung up his life jacket, Weinstein returned to his office to join a call with a team of Trimble engineers who will work alongside him to pull apart the conceptual model. Looking at the practicalities of the structure and the elements that are to sit inside it, and all this from opposite sides of the world. You can see the level of complexity in some of these areas. It's about a 30 metre span, uh, tapers off to a very thin point at the end. Could you annotate up the, the model within Triple Connect so that Frank and Julie can see that straight away and be able to make comments and changes that you can then experience? Some of this, it's a practical preconception of covering a large area with as light a structure as possible and making it look as different from a classical Roman uh, piece as possible. I really enjoy the collaborative process in this method of making things. It can feed back upstream very easily through the, the connected methods. And so if you're showing me a deflection characteristic that is approaching a limit or where you're having particular trouble, uh, we can then look at the design um, and deepen it. Just give us some guidelines and we'll, we'll work that back through. You can see that there are most certainly areas, you know, that get very congested with regards to connections. Uh, and of course, with the actual limitations of the site and drainage and things like that, I was trying to think about breaking the model down into very much more accessible and easier chunks to work with, thinking of bits we could just sort of put together and build. You can see the level of complexity in some of these areas just to make it so we could actually erect it and fit it all together. If we made the top much thicker, those low angle trusses would look a little bit better. I think that's going to help everyone. I think that would uh, potentially stiffen up the structure as well. Uh, we can make those uh, trusses stiffer, and then Steve uh, presumably will have a, a, a lot, uh, a lot more fun doing the connections. Yeah, we caught some amazing stuff here, and just the whole conversation and being able to experience it in 3D over a conversation that could have been in 2D makes so much difference. You know, I, I've witnessed conversations in. In 2D, where it's almost like you can't experience what that structure, especially where it's going to be visible, is going to look like. And, and actually seeing it, understanding the complexities, it, it's like apparent that there's an issue immediately. All those connecting points oh, that was, was like, oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. It has been really useful, this actually. It's, uh, it's really good for us. We can, we can go on and, and sort of have a bit more confidence in making changes. Um, to, to make things easier for structurally and for uh, Steve's detailing as well. As with any build, there were literally thousands of practical considerations that the team would need to overcome together as they evolved the conceptual model to engineer it in a way that would work structurally and adding in practicalities like the MEP. But even from their home countries, without ever meeting in person, or visiting the site, the team were able to achieve rapid iterations, making changes in the moment directly into the shared model. In the next episode of The Great Library, we get prepared to execute construction, looking at how technology can help in the estimating, bidding, management and prefabrication stages of the project. We'll look at how technology is changing the game in the final stages before construction. As our engineers collaborate with our contractor, we'll cover all the bases to get our digital planning up to the point where a construction team could actually start moving in on site. We'll also meet Adam Namath, our man in the metaverse, who's helping to make sure that the knowledge we're gaining through this project 
It's preserved and made available to the entire construction industry, helping bring forward the day when these ambitious ideas become the norm on real-world projects all across the globe.